My name is Carlo Cavallero. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Senior Legal Counsel for Use Again LLC. Use Again's focus is to collect and resell used clothes, shoes, textile, and other household material. We collect this material via collection bins that are placed in the public space. The material we collect is then wholesaled. We are a for-profit corporation based in West Chicago, Illinois. The focus of my presentation is intended to highlight some of the recent activities in the area of waste diversion and to highlight some of the regulatory challenges facing some efforts to divert waste or to increase recycling. I plan to use my experience to expose some barriers to increase recycling and discuss the actions you can take to change that. First, some context. According to some sources, local government administrative professionals are dealing with three rapidly expanding areas of focus transparency, citizen engagement, sustainability. Obviously, these are over and above their daily tasks to uh, implement the operation of the city. While transparency is not really related to the focus of this coursework, the more important realization is that citizen engagement and sustainability are directly related because improving waste management requires our governments and its agencies to engage the public to change individual behavior. They also must look inward to truly change their way of thinking and acting to truly implement sustainability. Focusing on recycling and waste reduction. In 2012, the U.S. Senate issued a press release declaring that the recycling industry has the capacity to deliver and create 85 times more jobs than the landfilling industry. This was a result of a long-term governmental study on waste and recycling industries. With today's economy, this fact should be all the motivation we need to adopt a Recycle Everything Now strategy. In many cases, that is what's going on, but it's not on a mass scale, and it's not ubiquitous. To change the current dynamic, it will take more than adding new materials to the waste stream, or removing new materials from the waste stream is more accurate. There also has to be some real self-assessment of what we are doing and not only ask the question whether this is right, but make the changes to implement improvements and collect other materials. As recycling continues to roll out across the country, yes, some communities, regions, counties, still do not recycle at all. This is most likely to be accomplished via the implementation of a single stream recycling model that has been effective all across the country for decades now. However, instead of simply adopting the same recycling program that was implemented 20 years ago, why not reassess and revise the program to address and meet the current market and uses for the recyclable materials? How about focusing on industries that can be created through such efforts? How does this relate to recycling and sustainability? Our current model of recycling and waste diversion is perfectly suited to maintain the status quo. However, these models or methods may be inadequate to deal with other material types. Change will not happen quickly with a single stream curbside model. Why? There's a lot of time, energy, and capital investment in the traditional curbside system for anyone to create wholesale changes. In, in some respects, expecting or waiting for that change may be unnecessary. What if we start to think differently about what we recycle and why and how to do it? The markets need to be assessed, and we need to listen to what the assessment tells us. Einstein is quoted as defining insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Therefore, you'd point the finger at us who want to continue to use a single stream system and just simply add new material to that process. I was once told by the solid waste manager for Dubuque, Iowa, that green glass is so undesirable or hard to get rid of that they ship it from Iowa to Indiana and then back into Illinois to get it recycled. His novel solution, simply throw it all in a landfill or grind it up as filler for asphalt. I don't need the time or expertise to fully explain this issue in detail. However, the basic premise is that it takes more to recycle green glass at an increased cost and the market is simply not the same for green glass versus the other. Thus, it has a lesser value. If you exempt it, green glass that is, from recycling, the overall cost of recycling glass should drop and the markets for recycled glass would be solidified by not having to address 
this lesser valuable, potentially problematic material. For the record, from his perspective, glass itself presents no harm in the landfill, and it can easily be used as filler in their various construction projects. After all, it's a lot simpler to differentiate green glass from clear while we're in our home than it is the recyclable plastics for those that are not. Well, at least that's my perspective. Alternatively, you continue to collect green glass. You just don't send it through to recycling. That should create a new market for its uses as well. This is a great example for the need of specialized collection processing and redistribution networks to really increase our recycling rate and waste diversion. Here's another example. Rewall is a company in Des Moines, Iowa, once again in Iowa, that makes drywall alternative from compressed milk cartons. Rewall collected the discarded milk cartons from the local schools and diverts them from the waste stream to make their product. The milk carton's wax coating made them not easily recyclable with cardboard. Thus, the supply being readily available and expandable, the creation of this new drywall product created a self-sustaining waste diversion model. Now, to throw in a sustainability practice, the implementation of a public policy to utilize Rewall's products in all governmental construction products helps sustain the market for the material which in turn sustains the motivation to divert this material from the waste stream. In short, it is important to note that this is all at no cost to anyone and actually creates a positive economic benefit. All right, shifting gears. How do we start to change the public policies that are standing in our way? Let's start with how we look at waste and recycling and in the process completely overhaul the definitions and term we use in the process. This past fall, the Illinois Recycling Association voiced its support to the following hierarchy for waste reduction, which was presented to the Illinois Task Force for Advancement of Material Recycling. I'll talk a little more about the task force later. One is source reduction to reduce the amount of solid waste generated. Two, reuse of solid waste. Three, recycling of solid waste. Four, composting of solid waste. Five, recovery of energy from solid waste. Six, land disposal of solid waste. And seven, simply burning or incineration of the garbage without energy recovery. Mind you, there's a lot of debate about what is reuse and what is recycling. Why does it matter? In one sense, it is just important that we be clear on which is appropriate depending on what we are discussing. But more importantly, money. Money in many cases in the form of governmental grants are provided for one term, but not for another. Thus, a recycling grant may not be used for reuse, even though from some viewpoints, reuse is a better utilization of waste material. Just like the green glass example, we need to listen to the market and make the regulatory changes to make it work better. Source reduction is being pushed internally throughout the manufacturing industries largely motivated by consumer demand for more environmentally friendly and sustainable, sustainable packaging designs. From my perspective, this is a movement that needs no taxpayer money support, but deserves recognition. These initiatives are driven by corporate America's desire to be green, and more importantly, in response to the demands of their customers. We see it in our business in the form of clothing manufacturers and retailers partnering with companies like Usagen to close the loop and increase sustainability. Again, just one example that is familiar to me. The remaining components of the hierarchy are largely dependent upon the public policy decisions made at all levels of government. However, our ability to achieve the goal of this hierarchy, reducing solid waste to as near zero as possible, requires a lot of regulatory analysis and the will to make the changes necessary at all levels of government. What stands in the way of increasing collections? Closed-minded regulators who only see stereotypes and the lack of an open mind? Governments need to be reminded of the need for new systems and to embrace innovation. We need to learn not to fear failure. We need to learn from our mistakes. The desire to follow best practices can conversely be described as doing things the same old way. In reality, it may be stifling innovation. Organic composting is a prime example of material that desperately needs to be diverted 
and where every level of government operates as a barrier to that sustainable practice. What do you think would happen if we attempted to collect pumpkins after Halloween in order to compost them? Well, in reality, this would violate more than a few state laws, as well as several local regulations, and probably incur any number of citations and fines. All for doing what is naturally occurring process, the decomposition of organic matter into dirt. Actually, we would need a landfill permit under the IL EPA regulations. We can throw the pumpkins all out in the landfill, but cannot aggregate them on a farm to decay and be returned as compost one day. Do you find it odd that we can let them all rot on our front porches at each of our homes, but we cannot take them to the local park and compost them? I know another presentation focused on composting, but there's one thing worth repeating. Organic materials is one of the heaviest material in our waste stream. Its removal in even small percentages would reap huge benefits. Imagine one day needing smaller, lighter garbage trucks. The ILPA has standards for any sort of collection facility. The unit of local government will have zoning codes and general ordinances that regulate such activity or even simply ban them. Then finally, the county, most likely through the health department, will probably have something to say. All this means costs and prohibitions. The general public, in many cases, stands in the way for no good reason. These are not all for naught. Many of these regulations have good standing and good reason. Breaking down the regulatory barriers. Our clothing collection bins face zoning and regulatory challenges on a routine basis. In nearly every instance, the diversion benefit is identified, but nonetheless, many bin bans are implemented in complete conflict with the municipality's overriding public policy directive to increase sustainability and specifically divert more waste and recycle more. Standalone collection bins have been used to collect unwanted materials for decades, if not hundreds of years. After all, isn't a trash can in the corner simply a collection bin for unwanted materials? The issue at hand is unintended collection bins are not specifically defined in the local zoning codes. The state level is not an answer, as to attempt to authorize them would require an override of local government's home rule authority. That always invites a chorus of complaints from local governments about unfunded mandates and an intrusion on their sovereignty over issues of purely local concern. One forward-thinking council member once suggested that he saw the future in using these bins to move towards zero waste without incurring costs to the government or citizens. He went on to suggest that our current view and policies on local zoning and regulations needed to adapt to the changing times. In other words, our opinion of what is correct, correct for the character of our community must adapt to encompass what is necessary for the character of our entire planet. So if that means placing a few bins in empty parking spaces at shopping malls to divert waste, then the higher good is served. From my perspective, a bold first step would be to remove the zoning restrictions from all the more unique waste diversion tactics, allow the collection and composting of pumpkins per se. There's a significant benefit because zoning code changes, like many other issues before units of local government, have a tendency to sweep across communities based on assumptions and someone else's experiences. Thus, some hard work to change a few communities' minds may lead to many more following suit once they see the results. That shows the level and detail of how these problems need to be studied and changed. One of the easiest solutions would be to support and promote test cases or test sites. Thus, instead of simply banning the concept, how about supporting it and learning from it? Follow the positive examples. For instance, one of my favorite examples, the Algonquin Township Highway Department long ago adopted the philosophy to try and recycle everything it could. That thinking has been employed by its commissioner, Robert Miller, Bob. At each opportunity, Bob has embraced and implemented changes to recycle more. His dedication to just getting it done has led to some novel concepts that are not the norm and some are truly out of the box. Their site in Crystal Lake is a testament to what can happen if the motivation is there. On their site, they recycle the traditional materials of paper, plastic, cardboard, glass, and aluminum. They do so in some old roll-off dumpsters that were obtained from a regional waste hauler at almost no cost at all. However, they also operate some other recycling programs. They accept tree trimmings from township residents, which are double ground to kill the amber lash borer, into mulch, which is then given away for free to residents. My favorite is their use of used oils to heat their buildings. This was implemented when Bob purchased used oil burning furnaces specifically to heat their garages. They host eight of our clothing collection bins and three shoe collection bins from another operator. 
They recycle paint and give away the indoor latex paint in five gallon buckets to anyone who wants it. They collect and recycle e-waste. They recycle and reuse their ground up asphalt to repair the roads. All of this has, has been accomplished with very little cost to the township, but enormous gains from a sustainability and waste diversion stand viewpoint. This is a model for the future. What can you do to change this cycle that thwarts innovation? Get involved. Volunteer for communities at the local government level. If your town does not have a green or sustainability committee, work on creating one. If your community does not have a sustainability plan, help them get one started. In closing, in 2012, the Illinois General Assembly passed House Bill 4986. That created the task force mentioned earlier. The mandate of the task force was to review the status of recycling and solid waste management planning in Illinois. The task force has been meeting for just over a year and has plans to issue a report sometime in 2015. In short, the process has just begun. The goal would be that after the issuance of the report, a public policy debate would ensue that should lead to the development and implementation of new plans and programs to increase recycling and promote waste diversion. Getting engaged now puts you on the ground floor of this process and provides the ability to affect real changes for the futures. Thank you for this opportunity.